Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's truly an honor for us to be here today. Uh, I'm Command Sergeant Major John Wayne Troxell. I serve as the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joe Dunford. I also serve as the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Mattis. And on the panel with me here today are my esteemed colleagues and battle buddies. And I'd like to introduce them right quick. To my immediate right is the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major Ron Green. To the far right, Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly. To my immediate left, the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Steve Giordano. To his left is the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant K. Wright. And to our far left is our Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Steve Cantrell. You know, first, let me say first, it's an incredible opportunity for all of us to be here today, uh, all at one time to talk about the backbone of our armed forces, that being our enlisted force. We'd like to address three main topics today. First is uh, personal readiness, individual readiness, which includes uh, the manning, equipping, and training of our force, especially under the budgetary <coughs> constraints we have today. Personal policies that affect our servicemen and women, and where we are at with enlisted leader development both now and in the future. From an overall perspective, we can say that our U.S. Armed Forces are always ready to fight and win our nation's wars. But readiness under a resource-constrained environment takes its toll over the years. Our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen across the total force feel these constraints. If I have one takeaway from my travels and conversations with our troops around the world, it's consistency, consistency and predictability, whether that's with pay and entitlements or training and operational deployments, will go along to keeping our morale high. The services here are tasked with the monumental job of manning, training, and equipping the force to perform war fighting, peacekeeping, and humanitarian tasks. I'll let the gentlemen here with me today address their individual services, but suffice it to say our nation depends on our ability to be in the right place at the right time with the right qualities and capacities to protect our nation. And that leads me to the final topic, enlisted leader development. We know that without a doubt, our people are not only our most valuable resource, but they are also our greatest competitive advantage when it comes to fighting and winning our nation's wars. What we do to educate, develop, and empower our enlisted leaders will be the decisive factor in accomplishing the missions our country asks of us. And with that, we'll open it up to your questions. Yes, sir. Sergeant Major, um, with, uh, some, with some of the things that came up, have come up over the past year, whether it's the Marines United issue um, or uh, seaworthiness in the Navy with Seventh Fleet issues, how much has, have senior enlisted personnel across, across the services um, borne the responsibility for some, of, for some of these issues, whether they be accidents, training issues, uh, personnel issues. How much of it has fallen on the officers, whereas some of this should have should have fallen on the shoulders of senior enlisted personnel? And do you think senior enlisted personnel have stepped up to the plate enough on some of these issues? So I'll start off with that, sir, and then I'll ask my colleagues to answer. First of all, anytime it comes to anything accident related or something that affects uh, the health or, or safety of our men and women, all leaders have to be involved, from the deck plate level all the way to the senior level. So we take all of these cases seriously, and, and leader empowerment and leader engagement is something that we talk about all the time. And uh, Gio, I've asked you to comment on that if you could. Um, so if you're not aware, you know, of course, you know, initial accountability was, uh, you know, those things have already been administered. But uh, so that immediate assessment was kind of already done. But we've also just recently established a convening authority. The Vice Chief of Naval Operations established a convening authority to kind of look at that, uh, that accountability picture holistically, dot the I's, cross the T's, and uh, look at all avenues of responsibility associated with some of those cases. And I'd ask uh, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps also to comment. I mean, to your point, sir, um, you know, when Joe Neller, the commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, went before the SASC and, and, and testified, you know, about Marines United. Uh, you don't normally see the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, you know, with the, with the Commandant or any of us in front of the SASC. But that particular day, I was there with him. And that was for accountability 
to show the entire Marine Corps, Corps and the world that senior enlisted are being held accountable. And uh, I invite that. I invite that because most of what they were talking about was enlisted business. Leadership is a team. It's a team. And that's the way we show up, not just for the good, but for those things that go wrong as well. Tara. Thank you, sir. Um, excuse my voice, I'm getting over a cold. But uh, over the last few years, as the service chiefs have gone up to the Hill, they have repeatedly warned lawnmakers that the amount of risk <clears throat> the forces were taking was increasing. And I wanted to ask, given the accidents, given some of the drops in readiness, are we at the point where the force is breaking? And going into 2018, if kind of going across the board, if each of you could say, what is the thing that worries you the most going into 2018, whether it's the readiness of your rotary aircraft, your uh, you know, ground forces, <coughs> just give us some specifics of what you worry about into this next year. So I'll answer first, and then Dan, we'll start with you to go down the line here. Um, you know, over the past 16 years, because of our high operational tempo, because of unstable budgets and things like that, we haven't been able to get after modernization or maintenance like we would like to. However, having said all of that, uh, there's three absolutes that uh, we believe in. And that's we, we absolutely still, as a U.S. Armed Force, can defend our homeland and our way of life. We can absolutely meet our alliance commitments and, uh, and support our partners. And we absolutely have war fighting advantages in every war fighting domain, specifically in the human domain. Back to your question, sir. No other nation in the world empowers and entrusts enlisted leaders like we do. And I think uh, that we can still absolutely do all three of those things. So, Dan, we'll, we'll go to you about the 2018. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, the world is a very complex environment, and the Army is a very busy organization, along with uh, my counterparts that are sitting here today. Um, and to say that we don't assume risk in places uh, would just not be true. We do. Um, we have to manage that. And that's why the service chiefs have, have made their testimony on the amount of risk that they feel that we are assuming. Uh, what I worry about in 2018 is to make sure that we have uh, predictable and consistent funding in order to make sure that our soldiers are resourced appropriately, one, for the threat, and prepare for any emerging threats. Um, we have a simultaneous mission. We have to assure, deter, and possibly defeat our potential allies. So that's probably my biggest uh, worry for the for 2018. One second, sir. Steve, the 2018. I would say for the Coast Guard, anyway, even though we are considered one of the five armed services, I don't worry as much because have you seen over the last three months with the Coast Guard's heavy involvement with Hurricane, uh, the three hurricanes that we had in the Caribbean, uh, we really, I think, showed up uh, as a small service, uh, degraded our readiness to some, some degree, but we saved over 12,000 lives, uh, often with equipment that's very old. And this mantra that we've heard about uh, doing more with less, the Coast Guard doesn't buy into that anymore uh, because we shouldn't be doing more with less. We should be, ex our folks should expect to get the resources they need to do their job that the American public expects them to do. Uh, so I don't worry as much. I think our folks are doing very well. The morale is high. We enjoy a very high retention rate in our service, uh, despite all the heavy work that we've done on top of all the other missions that your Coast Guard <coughs> has to do. So. Uh, I think I, I'll agree with Sergeant Major of the Army. A predictable and consistent budget process will help some of that, but I don't, I don't worry that much about it. I think we have a strong enough voice that we'll, uh, we'll get that message across loud and clear over the next few months. And last but not least, Kay Wright. Yeah, so from the Air Force perspective, uh, I, I agree with Sergeant Major of the Army that a uh, predictable budget is, is the thing that concerns me the most, making sure that we can continue to uh, invest in research and development. We can continue to pour money into recapping the, the, the weapon systems that we have and and also uh, increase our to continue our increase in, in manpower. So we're on a pretty, pretty uh, good pace to increase the manpower that we have in areas like maintenance and space and cyber so that we can continue to the, the things that we do the best uh, from an air power perspective. Yes, sir. Or if you talk a little bit about recruiting, particularly with the Army, the Army is bringing in more Cat 4 <coughs> soldiers, those who scored the lowest on the aptitude tests. The Army was considering and then rescinded bringing in those with uh, mental illnesses. So I want you all to talk about your challenges with recruiting, particularly with regard to the Army, and are you worried that you're clearly bringing in a lower quality recruit? What impact that can have on the force? Okay, I'll, I'll start and then we'll start down here again and go this way. Um, 
from a Department of Defense and from a joint perspective, we understand that uh, in order to get the talent we need for the force we need now and in the future, we got to continue to prospect for that talent. And we can't rely solely on processing, meaning that we've got to have men and women that are out there in our recruiting commands that are going out and actively engaging key leaders, key spheres of influence in the community to find the kind of talent we need, especially in specialties like cyber or people that can excel in the nuclear uh, domain or in space. So that's kind of our focus from a DOD and a joint staff perspective. And we'll start down here with the Army and we'll work our way down on each of the services. Go ahead, Dan. Sure. It just, uh, just one comment back with, with regards to your statement, sir, with us intending to bring people in with uh, mental or behavioral health issues or concerns. That was never the intent. Everything is done from a waiver process. We meet, and we have met, and we will continue to meet all DOD mandated thresholds for, for uh, our entry-level soldiers from our Sessions Command. We haven't. Um, year to year, we get closer um, or farther away from the DOD standard, um, but we have always exceeded the DOD standard. I mean far away from not making it, but we've always exceeded, and we'll continue to do that. Um, sessions is tough. It's a tough mission. But you're bringing in more CAD 4, aren't you? I'd have, to, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers. That's what I've, I've been told. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers. Um, as we talked right today, are you talking 2000 previous well, year current. or, or yeah. current? Yeah, I, have to, I don't know. I have to go back and look at the numbers, the number of Cat 4s we have. What we do is we don't look at it from um, a snapshot in time. We have an annual requirement to make a DOD standard, and, uh, and our team down at USREC says that they're going to meet or exceed that DOD standard for the year. From a Marine, from a Marine Corps perspective, sir, uh, we meet, we've met our, our recruiting goals. However, we're looking at, you know, um, what's happening out in our nation with those we recruit. Uh, when you talk about millennials, when you talk about the IGNs, it's really understanding what's going on, you know, um, out, outside of the military, outside of DOD, uh, changes that are, that are happening within the culture, just, I mean, over evolution. So understanding that and understanding the impact that it has on the service and what type of programs you need to meet those challenges or those changes. That's what we're looking at um, when you talk about emotional intelligence, the different types of, you know, um, uh, tests out there to, to, to take a look at that. We owe that to the people. We owe that to the public. We owe that to those we recruit to put them in the best situation, to put this, this building, our nation, in the best situation to win the war. So quality of personnel will always be looked at from not just from the accessions, but also from from retention, from retention. And then we have a we have a, a responsibility to re to return better citizens to the nation. So that quality is being looked at all across the spectrum, sir. One thing I'll add before I go on to the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, if you look at our recruiting standards and our access and, and enlistment standards, right now around 25 percent of all 18 to 24 year olds in the United States qualify for military service. So the men and women we're bringing in are the best that society has to offer. Yeah, I, you know, we've met uh, recruiting efforts um, for over 10 years now. We've met our recruiting goals. And uh, that's both in the active component and the reserve component. And uh, the talent across that timeline continues to be better than uh, the people before them. And you can look at the metrics that will attest to that. They come in more capable, uh, better educated than we were when we assessed into the service. And uh, we continue to go at that, that talent out there uh, in the civilian sector. Uh, by all measures, we are a reflection of society. And, uh, and we all recruit to, uh, to assess that talent, just like uh, the civilian sector does as well. But we look at, you know, the health of the force through the same external factors that the Sergeant Major talked about uh, in regards to how's the economy doing, how's the employment rate doing out there. And then we also look at the internal factors that policies and programs that we control as well, too, to uh, continue to ensure that we're assessing that talent. Okay. Okay. Nope, no real recruiting challenges for the Air Force, so recruiting for all of us. Uh, it it's, can be tough at times with the number of people who are, one, eligible to serve, and two, some things that we, we may not think about, but those who have the propensity and want to, to serve. And as we, uh, you know, uh, 
compete with colleges and, and other opportunities, the, the economy for, for folks to go and do. But Air Force, we do a, a pretty good job of, of recruiting and, and meeting the goals that we have. And, and like I mentioned before, uh, we're on a pretty good uh, glide path to increase our manning and, and meet our requirements. Steve. And I'll say the Coast Guard's had very, uh, very well with our recruiting over the last few years. Even though we've increased a little bit, we continue to make our goals. Uh, with an effort on investing in these folks as soon as they come into the service. And that's starting, uh, we're, we're thinking when they join our Coast Guard that we're gonna keep them for 20 or 30 years. And we start their investment from recruit training all the way through uh, their advancement through their first enlistments, which by the way, we enjoy about a 90% retention rate at that first enlistment. So good, in fact, and I won't pick on my brothers here, but uh, we get an awful lot of prior service that come in our service. And I would, I would, put the challenge out there for, for my, my friends up here to find me a United States Coast Guardsman that left the Coast Guard and went to one of their services. <laughs> and I'll buy them lunch if that happens. But, uh, but we're Coast doing Guardsman very well in our folks. The Air Force, so. yeah. <laughs> Except the Air Force. But we're yes, doing sir. well. Yeah. How concerned are all of you with the spike in the aircraft crashes this year? I left so, the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I try not to get too concerned about uh, some of these crashes. We, we try to look at each, each of them individually and do the in-depth uh, research and analysis uh, about why. Uh, thus far, from the Air Force perspective, we haven't seen any uh, real trends that indicate there's a, an Air Force-wide problem. Uh, but we'll continue to take a look at each one of those as, uh, as they happen uh, from an uh, operational risk management perspective. Go ahead, Ron. You know, some of those crashes are probably you know, focused at the Marine Corps. Um, like uh, Chief Master in the Air Force said, <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned with each one of them. But I understand we had about 155 Marines die last year, about 20 or this, this year, uh, last fiscal year, in aircraft. Not just the aircraft, but every, every incident we're concerned with, every one of them. The vehicular accidents, you know, everything. Uh, some things you can't, you know, help sicknesses and things, disease, those type of uh, situations. But we look at those as well to see if we miss something. What is it that we missed? You know, we fought for 16 years, and we're still in the fight. And we're, we're doing very well. We're winning. But understand, 16 years of war, you know, it, it has consequences. It has consequences. Despite the consequences of fighting, you know, OEF, OIF, and everything we're doing now, we're still winning. We're still winning. So we're going to look at each one of those, not just that the, the the aircraft, you know, crashes that we have, but every death that we have in the military, especially in the Marine Corps. I'm speaking from a core perspective, perspective, but I know each one of us feel this way. We're going to look at each one of them, and we're going to do our best, you know, to put put policy procedure in place if that's what's lacking, um, training, whatever it is. We're going to get after. It. So I'd just like to finish that one off. So when you look at what we're doing across the world in terms of what we need to do to assure our allies, deter any kind of nation state or non-state actor <laughs> aggression, be able to do the lasting defeat of ISIS, and also defend our homeland, that, that comes at a, a, a great cost in terms of deployment. And you, you look at 196 nations in the world, we're in about 167 of them right now. Uh, at about 250,000 troops doing that. So when you put the troops out there like that and the operational tempo goes up, obviously the risk goes up. But what we have to do, and just to echo what the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps said, we have to make sure that we look at every accident and we do a, an investigation of where we need to get better at and where we don't allow this to happen again. But two, we also have to continue to develop our leaders to not only be able to mitigate risk, but to anticipate and communicate that risk both up and down the chain as we move forward. Sergeant Major, aren't you concerned that twice as many U.S. troops have been killed in aviation crashes this year compared to last year? Absolutely. We're concerned about, we, absolutely we're concerned about that. But most importantly, we're concerned about any death we have, whether it's combat related or non-combat related. Um, but here recently, you know, we've had a lot more non-combat related deaths. So we really have to look internally at ourselves with a critical lens to see where we, we need to get better at in terms of handling risk and getting better at being safe. A lot of, 
Lawmakers on Capitol Hill are saying the U.S. military is in a crisis right now. All these different accents, whether it's on the air, land, or sea. Is the military in crisis right now? From my perspective, from a joint perspective, I, I don't think we're in crisis right now. I'll let the individual services answer on that. Dan? No, I don't see this in a crisis at all. Like I said, we, are, we live in a very complex environment. That complex environment is going to create, uh, you know, challenges for the military. Um, but we have and we'll continue to overcome each one of those challenges. And, you know, to, to people looking on the outside looking in, it's so like whack-a-mole. You know, if it's not aircraft next year, whatever that high number is, we're going to be talking about it. So whatever that high number is, we're going to get after it. We're going to get after it. Um, it's aircraft this year. But you look at the aircraft, you know, perspective years before. The, what's happening now, that's exactly what we're studying. Is it, you know, depth to dwell? Is it leader to lead? What, what exactly it is? We'll get after it as we've done in the past, and we'll, we'll make that correction, and we'll still be the most lethal force on the face of this earth. Go ahead. You know, I travel the world, and I get out and I have a conversation with a lot of sailors, a lot of family members as well, too. And uh, you can look them all in the eye. And uh, first and foremost, I'll tell you, they love being a United States Navy sailor. I love being a United States Navy sailor. And uh, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing right now. And we ask uh, our sailors to operate across the globe on a number of different platforms. And sometimes tragedy happens. And that's an unfortunate, inherent nature of our business. And. Uh, but our sailors need to have trust and confidence in their leaders that we'll learn from these things and we'll go at this stuff. And there'll be some things that we can take care of quickly. There'll be some things that we'll have to look at over the, over the interim. And then there may be some long-term things that, that we can kind of go after and, and correct things on. And our sailors know that about our leadership. <coughs> and I, I don't worry about whether sailors are ready to take the fight to the fight. I don't worry about that because they will, because that's just who we are as U.S. Navy sailors. And that's what our nation asks us to be for them. And we'll keep being those people. But we'll keep learning through these things as well, too. And, uh, and, and that's just kind of, I think, how we view things here in the Navy today. Yeah, just to get to the brunt of your question, I don't believe we're in a crisis, uh, obviously, in a uh, a risk-based business like combat arms, specifically aviation, uh, you know, you'll you'll have some some accidents, you'll have incidents. I think the most important thing that that all of us uh, again take a look at is we put the right amount of resources and energy toward investigating those specific incidents and and learning from them and growing from. Them. I, I have a high level of confidence in our uh, aviation community uh, as a, from an Air Force perspective. Uh, all of our uh, pilots, our instructor pilots, and the programs that, that we implement. To After the T-38 crash last week, are those still grounded? Uh, I believe, I, I, I'm not quite sure, but I'll I get back to you. One of the points that came out in the recent hearings following some of the Navy collisions um, was the inability for the services to say no when asked to fill a COCOM requirement. And what I am hearing today, and I just want to see if I'm hearing correctly, is that there really is that kind of inability to say no. You will meet what the partners want. You'll meet what the co-coms want. You can, I've heard it, you can do all of these things, but there definitely seems to be a consequence. So you know, is well, there an inability to I, say no? I would no? have to say that at all levels, you know, commanders manage risk at all levels. And when it comes, when, when we say, you know, we have to defend our homeland, Obviously, we're going to get after that mission of defending the homeland, whether that's at sea, in the air, or on the ground, or wherever it's at. Um, but commanders at all levels are charged, and, and senior listed at all levels, are charged to manage the risk at their appropriate level and to get after that. So I go back to what I said earlier. I don't think we have a systemic problem in terms of, you know, being unsafe or whatever it is. I just think we have to continue to look at these incidents and we got to figure out where the problem is and, and attack it from that angle. So, go ahead. And if I can say something, ma'am, let me tell you. That I can tell you now, we, we get more requests than we feel. I can tell you that. We do not feel every request for forces that comes out of there. You all just don't get to hear about everything. And that's a good thing. 
because we're not into giving in any any advantages. We don't feel every we feel the requests that we think we can do, the, and the commandant accepts the amount of risk that he think is appropriate. But that conversation between the COCOMs, you know, and the service chiefs, that's that's at their level. And if we're filling a request, it's because we know we can do the job. And Tara, just to finish out, I've sat in some tank meetings with the chairman, the service chiefs, and the combatant commanders. And when they talk about capabilities and requirements, what they always talk about is the risk to the force and the risk to mission. And then even so much the service chiefs will talk about the risk to the institution. If we continue to do business like this, how will it affect our services in the near future or the long term? Okay, ma'am, you had your hand up back there. And ma'am, I'm coming to you next right here. I'm sorry. Uh, Colonel Abad, Voice of America, thank you guys for doing this. With all due respect, I'm hearing all of you say that it's not a crisis mode. I'm hearing that we're winning after 16 years of war. I'm hearing that we, we're, we're not in a crisis, but we, we have a shortage of 3,000 maintainers. We have sailors that can take the fight, but we've had four different investigations that have shown that the sailors were not in, trained in the basics. They didn't have the basics down. So I'm just kind of wondering, what is your definition of a crisis, and what is your definition of winning? Because from the outside looking in, with all due respect, we're seeing a lot of problems all at once. Let me hit it first. So I'll, I'll tackle the winning piece. So I was just in Raqqa, Syria about uh, four weeks ago, and what I saw over there was our U.S forces, advising partner forces, and we had ISIS on the run. As a matter of fact, I was on the ground for four hours and I could not believe the level of uh, lethality we were putting on ISIS and they were still holding out. And if you look at where ISIS was in 2014, where they basically had almost all of Iraq under control and then they started moving into Syria, they were a huge problem in 2014. But with the strategy we have now, where we are building partner capacity, we're training, advising, assisting, and in some cases accompanying our partner forces, we have ISIS on the run in the Middle East. Now, obviously, this is a generational threat that is born out of an ideology, and they're also trying to do things in Africa, in Europe, and other places. But when you look at the effect we've had on ISIS and how that gets to defending the homeland, that's huge, very huge. And uh, I'll ask any other comments. I would just so. say, oh, no. yeah, go ahead, no. Dean. Oh, I was going to say, I think it's all about perspective, right? So uh, you may see uh, the the challenges that that we have, that we all have as uh, as a service, uh, that any organization might have. Uh, what what you might not see are the the thousands and thousands of great things that our service members do on a regular basis, both in combat and. Uh, from a training perspective, from a humanitarian uh, support. So uh, lot, th that's really how, how at least how I can speak for the Air Force, uh, how we see it, the perspective that we take is while we do have uh, challenges, we've always had challenges, we will likely always have challenges in the future. Uh, you know, you balance that against uh, the great things that, that, that we do for this nation, uh, and, and you, it, it becomes easy for me to, to, to not look at the, cha the, the challenges that we have as, as a crisis. When you talk to an airman who's done 13 deployments, that's a tough situation for that guy. When you talk to a Marine who's having to scrounge in a in a air yard uh, graveyard, what they call for parts, that's that's a crisis for that individual and for that team. So, I mean, is that not very concerning to you guys? Uh, and when you talk to an average Afghan who says 16 years of war when the Taliban is still making some gains in some areas, they wouldn't call that winning. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, is, is that not a factor in all of this positivity? Aside from the budget, everything else seems to be going positive based on this briefing. So can you help me understand? It's a concern, ma'am. It absolutely is. Um, if you're talking about crisis from a numbers, a parts, a budget, I don't think there's ever been, I've been in 34 years. Every day there's a, a crisis in something. There's a crisis in something. But you walk out and you ask the, the average Marine, are we in a crisis? I don't need to tell you we're, we're in a crisis. We are concerned about parts. We're addressing that. We are concerned about the budget. 
we're addressing that. This is not, you know, war is not, not something, you'll always be in crisis from that perspective. It, there's just not a day something, suicides, sexual assaults, harassments, safety, 30,000 Marines in and out a year. So in a four-year term, a four-year enlistment, 120,000 Marines come and go in the Marine Corps. 100, that's two-thirds of the Marine Corps would turn over. You would say outside, that's a crisis. Because Boeing doesn't do it, Google doesn't do it, 30,000 a year, the average age 25. We bring in 17-year-olds. Crisis? It's like Groundhog Day. But the fact that we're sitting there having freedom of speech, and we're having this conversation, and the people we're fighting against are not, that alone tells me we're winning. We're winning. And I, I absolutely understand where you're going, because we have to look gold star families in the eye when we lose someone. And that's serious. Every one of them is serious. Not only do we have to look them in the eye when we lose the individual, but they return to the Marine Corps and to the services to still sit beside us. That's a constant reminder that we always have to do better by our people. Always doing better by our people. That's why we're, 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 we're so focused in on those things that, that may not be a crisis outside of the building. But it's definitely a concern of ours. I don't, want you to to, I don't want you to think that we're not concerned about those things. We're not here to paint a rosy picture and try to pull the wool over uh, anybody's eyes, but, but as leaders of our respective uh, services, you know, we see every challenge as an opportunity, an opportunity for us uh, to invest more, to engage more, to create programs and processes that, that help our, that airman who's deployed uh, 13 times and that um, uh, corporal who can't get the, the parts and whatnot. So, so some of the things that you may see as a crisis, we see them as opportunities and, and subsequent challenges uh, for us to tackle. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say the same thing. Let go some of my, uh, my peers' uh, evaluations there. Is, uh, <coughs> the first time I ever heard that word is when you said it and I saw it on the news. I haven't had a single soldier tell me in three or four years that we're in crisis. We have challenges. It's a complex world. We have tragedies. Um, these young men and women need to know um, that the people in America believe the same thing they do and that they, they, they are out there doing great work for our nation every day. Our allies are assured. Our potential adversaries are deterred, and we will defeat if we have to. I, go ahead, sir. Yes, yeah, Major, um, can I ask, uh, there's a proposal out of Congress, 2.4% raise, White House 2.1%. Who knows where that comes out in the end? Then you got BAH, commissaries, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and it all might get wrapped up in another continuing resolution, and here we go again. Um, the troops come to you and they say, hey, Top, are you going to get a raise or what? What are these guys doing? What do you tell them? How does that affect morale? Well, we tell them exactly what's going on here. We, we're we here in the Beltway and in, in the Pentagon, and we serve in these high-level meetings uh, with our bosses here, but also on Capitol Hill, uh, so that we can tell the troops exactly what's going on. I can tell you in my travels, as I go around the world, um, the troops, there, there are concerns about stuff like dual BAH and things like that. But more importantly to the troops, they <coughs> want to have great quality of service along with that quality of life. Meaning, you know, I want the latest optics I can have on my rifles. I want uh, the latest kind of equipment or technology to get after this emerging unmanned aerial system threat. Very few complaints do I get on pay raises, or quality of life kind of issues. It's how can I get better at doing my mission uh, that you're expecting me to accomplish out there. there I'll open it up. There, Go there ahead. are three types of readiness, sir. Unit, which are services, personal, and family. Now, from a family perspective, you know, it. I'm an, I've, I've been in this job almost three years. I've never heard a Marine ask about a pay raise. What you will have Marines and families address is, you know, child development centers, youth sports, exceptional family member programs, uh, those programs that support the family, the Class B programs. It's not that it's a, a pay raise thing. It's when you say BAH, dual BAH, compensation, absolutely, absolutely. And those things we're absolutely involved in as senior enlisted. Those are the conversations that we have 
about the budget and how it affects, talk about continuing resolutions, you know, uh, you know, getting the budget in the middle of the year, this last fiscal year, having to try to crunch the money. We also go to the Hill as well to talk to Congress about these situations. And those are the things that we address, the quality of life issues that families address with us, as well as our service members, to make sure there's balance, to make sure there's balance. Because I don't care how much lethality we talk about, if we can't keep high quality warriors to, to fight for this nation, we're not going to win because they're not going to stay. We enlist the warrior, and for those who have families, we try to retain the family because they have a voice in whether they're going to stay or not. So that conversation, it's absolutely heard and being spoken to. Ma'am, go ahead. Uh, this is for Sergeant Major Daly. So the Army is looking to get bigger next year. What kind of mix of retention and accessions are you looking at, and what kind of incentives are you mulling on both sides? And thanks, Megan, for the question. So, yeah, we are, and we're happy about getting bigger. Um, and we're glad that our, lips, uh, our elected leaders are helping us do that. So we think the majority of that's going to come, roughly about 80K from, is our planning factor for our sessions right now. And we did so well last year in our in-service retention program that our in-service retention actually is not that big a significant number because we've already accomplished it for FY18, uh, preponderance of that in FY17. So from an incentive, um, you know, incentives are based upon the need and requirement by skill level and MOS. Uh, so what we won't see is a whole lot um, a bigger increase in bonuses unless we specifically need that skill level and MOS. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll tune our accessions um, incentives based upon how we do throughout the year. Do you see? Sir, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Uh, do you see doing two-year enlistments again or, or uh, you know, kind of quality of life uh, bonuses like that rather than just money? Uh, I see that I, I think we'll have to base it upon the needs. I think we'll have to base it upon the needs. So far right now, we're, we're a little bit below glide in the sessions, which is not concerning. Um, we're coming um, just first part of the year. Um, like I said, retention is doing great. Last year was uh, the best year we had in the decade, and I think we're just going to have to take it quarter by quarter and see where we fall. Sir, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, this is a personnel policy issue, the transgender guidance. Um, there have been two court-ordered injunctions now, but yet the SECDEF, I believe, has a January deadline for a, a sessions. So I'm just wondering what you guys are planning at this point. And the second part of the question is, I'm wondering if you're seeing any type of a morale issue, not just among transgender troops, but other troops who see the possibility of their fellow service members being separated based on their gender identity. So I'll take first part of the question, then I'll open it up to my colleagues for the second part. So right now, all of us right here serve on a Secretary of Defense uh, directed transgender policy that uh, is chaired by the Deputy Secretary of Defense and the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It includes our undersecretaries and others, um, but we're part of this panel that is looking to provide guidance to the Secretary on what a transgender service panel or service policy should look like. Right now, we've uh, been at this a couple of months. Uh, we have till the end of December to come up with a recommendation that we'll provide to the secretary then so that he can go forward with implementing the policy. And I'll leave that there. In terms of the morale, I'll let you all open it up to you all. I have not seen or uh, don't anticipate any uh, morale issues right now, so it, I think it really depends on uh, how, how this plays out. Uh, we all have varying uh, numbers of uh, members who might fall into the category of a transgender or someone with trans, uh, gender dysphoria or whatnot. But uh, to this point, from an Air Force perspective, uh, no, no morale issues. Okay. I'll say from the Coast Guard being the smallest service, absolutely no, no issues at all. Matter of fact, some of you might have heard uh, our service chief a couple months ago that made a public declaration that he would stand behind uh, all those members in our service that had started their transition uh, under the old guidelines. So I think our workforce appreciates that support. Uh, and again, I don't, I don't, I have not heard and don't expect that we'll have any morale issues in our United States Coast Guard. Yeah, there. I'll tell you, most sailors just occasionally it will come up um, and it's just kind of where are we with the policy? That's it. They just kind of want to know what are we doing? So Sir, I'm going to go to you because you've got the best looking haircut in the room. <laughs> and uh, you're giving me some recommendations here in about three years when I retire because, you know, uh, oh, yeah, I've had uh, this haircut for 35 I've years. I've only so. had this one for 10, so it, it, it stays well. Okay, um, good. <laughs> go ahead, sir. Um, I'm Scott Mossuni with Federal News Radio. Um, 
I wanted to ask, you know, the, the retention and recruitment numbers at this point sound like they're pretty good, but over the next 10 years, you know, there's some signs that are coming. The Blue Star Families survey just came out. 60% of uh, service members say they wouldn't recommend to their children uh, serving. I mean, you can look at your arms. There's a lot of deployments that you're doing. Um, how are you going to change your service in the next 10 years to uh, accommodate uh, future recruitment and, and retainment issues? So I'll speak from a you know, joint uh, perspective. Um, first of all, um, we have to be prepared to fight and win our nation's battles. And with that comes a certain set of standards that we have to have because uh, we can't predict uh, what our enemy is going to be able to do to us. So in order to maintain war fighting uh, competitive advantages, we have to make sure that we have the most quality people we have to do the job. Now, as you mentioned, and as I described earlier, you know, when 25 percent of 18 to 25 year olds don't qualify for military service, either due to not meeting the physical requirements or other issues, and then if you look at where that might be in the year of 2030, that's potentially a, a huge risk to our country right there. So as we move forward, we have to continue to have recruiting and accessing practices and policies that attract the best talent that we have. But we also have to get beyond what you already talked about, you know, um, if 1% of our force serves uh, right now, um, most of their influences in their family uh, hasn't come from their parents. It's come from their grandparents who were in the Vietnam era and things like that. So we have to make sure that we continue to provide uh, practices and policies that attract this talent as it comes in. That includes the new blended retirement, uh, credentialing, and other transition benefits that that will become a recruiting tool, I believe, in the future. And, and we probably won't know until this blended retirement system is online for a, a number of years whether that's a, a detriment to, to keeping folks around or, or if they are able to put money in a bank and get tuition assistance and get some a college degree and get credentials that will work on the outside, whether that will keep them in the service. I'm of the belief that folks believe that we invest in them, that they will stay for longer because – uh, the folks at the 10, 12 year mark uh, are the folks that we are heavily invested in and we want to keep them as career uh, servicemen through their time. But I think the jury's still Again, out on some of that. Again, not, not all young folks who are eligible to serve are necessarily propensity. You know, I wasn't that, that person. I didn't come from a military background and, and would not have likely uh, uh, joined the military had, had it not been for cert, uh, certain circumstances. H however, I think the greatest tool that, that, that we have is is, is offering uh, young men and women in America today the opportunity to do something that they love. And sometimes that's an actual occupation uh, like cyber or being a space operator, and sometimes that's uh, the opportunity to just serve uh, their country and do something bigger and, and better than themselves. So, I mean, we, we always look at ways that we can improve our, uh, our recruitment and retention. We always look at ways that we can make sure that we are, uh, you know, maintaining ties with the uh, evolving you know, ties of, uh, of the day, uh, you know, things like recently we, we, we started allowing more tattoos than we had in the past. I mean, that was just something that that's just evolution in, in, in recruiting. So, Okay, we'll go. Uh, go ahead, sir, then we'll go to you next, ma'am. Steve Losey, Air Force Times. Uh, my question is for Chief Wright. Uh, I want to ask you about deployments. You and the other Air Force leaders have expressed concern about the pace of deployments. Are you seeing it... Um, are you seeing the pressure and the pace increase? Are we looking at more airmen going on, say, a one-to-one -one deployment ratio? No, not specifically. So it, it really just kind of depends on the career field. So most of our one-to-one -one deployments uh, come from our battlefield airmen, our special forces, special forces uh, airmen. But uh, uh, you know, deployments are increasing uh, only because, uh, at least from an Air Force perspective, you know, we're in more places, right? So uh, a lot more deployments to Africa. Uh, a lot, more deployments uh, on the European um, uh, UCOM uh, AOR, so um, so not a huge increase in in deployment. Some of them are, are, are spread out. We're actually taking a look at some of our 365-day uh, uh, deployments to see if those, you know, if if we have the right number of folks uh, deploying for uh, a full year. So for those uh, airmen like the battlefield airmen, um, aside from trying to add more airmen, which I know you're trying to do, aside from the 365. What else are you doing to try to 
uh, ease the pressure, ease the burden on those airmen who have been deploying the most. <coughs> right. So, so one of the things that we try to look at is uh, uh, teaming up. Uh, we're actually looking at our construct uh, and, and and how we deploy and how we support support our combatant commanders. And uh, so we, you know, we'll continue to take a, a kind of a comprehensive look at deployments as a whole to make sure that one, we're meeting the requirements. Uh, and two, that we're uh, maintaining the right level of readiness and morale for, for, for those folks who, who frequently deploy. Go ahead, ma'am. I just want to go back briefly to the uh, question of whether or not there is a crisis of readiness. Um, because as several other people have mentioned, there's definitely a sense on Capitol Hill that there is. Um, and that's part of the reason that, a large part of the reason that the Armed Services Committees passed such a large defense authorization bill, one that blows past the budget caps. Um, so I, I guess two questions on that. If there isn't a crisis, why, why is there such a, why is there, can you give us a justification for why then, um, why we need to have such a large budget this year? And do you feel like your message, your, this, from the senior enlisted perspective, is getting to those leaders on Capitol Hill, your sense that it's a concern but not a crisis? Okay, I'll take that on first and then I'll pass it on. So, uh, you know, I, when we talk about crisis, um, I think about when's the last time we had an externally planned, an externally prepared, an externally executed attack on the United States? Well, it was 9-11. Okay, we've gotten much better at defending our homeland, whether it's through how we share information or what we're doing. It's having an impact on those violent extremists that pose a threat to us. Uh, the other thing is when you talk to a, a man or woman that serves in the United States military, there's things that they have to deal with every day. They may not have the right amount of people they sh buy their table of organization and equipment that they should have. They may not have the right amount of equipment to do what they need to do. And they may not have the right condition set, but every day whether it's a young staff sergeant airman, a joint terminal attack controller in, a, in a Syria that I saw in May, that in my opinion, he was the only guy out there with a couple of green berets. He was the air combat commander, if you ask me, because he kept putting lethal, my term, scunion on ISIS that was having a huge effect because of his ability to do the mission and because of his relationship with those remotely piloted aircraft. So. We don't look at that as a crisis, and our men and women don't look at that as a crisis. They look at every day I have to manage risk, and I have some things that I'm presented with every day that I have to deal with, and they get after it. I mean, the world is unstable, right? So there's an increasing demand for air power. There's an increasing demand for uh, intelligence, surveillance, and, and reconnaissance. And so, so as the world uh, becomes more uh, unstable around us, uh, then the need for uh, increased readiness, increased weapon systems, uh, you know, will we'll continue to increase. So, so again, we don't necessarily see that as a crisis inside the military, but, you know, we're responding to uh, the threats and the challenges of, of the world around us. Sorry, Major. You know, you look at the globe 16 years ago. We've been fighting non-nation states for the last 16 years. When you look out there, if you look back to, to 9, you know, 10, and you look at the view of the world, and who we were focused on 16 years later, totally different, totally different. There's some nation states out there that have absolutely captured our attention. And on top of that, you know, technology today doesn't cost what it did then. You know, when we started this 16-year war, it cost about $3,500 to outfit the basic infantry marine. Today it costs almost 16000 16000 16 years later. So when you talk about budget, you try to go from, you know, from where you started <coughs> in the 16-year war to the war we're going to fight today or tomorrow. Significantly different, costly. We've updated just about every aircraft platform in the Marine Corps. Sunset, the CH-46, V-22, has taken us further, more lethal, I mean, capability than ever before in the Marine Corps. And every aircraft rotary wing has got to chase that monster got to keep up with it, to protect it, to provide it, you know, support. So when you, when you look at it from that perspective, and then you look at the people you bring in, that's got to have the quality, when you talk about technology, to work that equipment. All of that equipment takes a person or people, a group of people. And where we 
you know, look at, you know, cl armed forces classification testing, whatever it is, you got to put people behind that, that cyber, that intel, that electronic warfare in numbers that we've never had to supply before. It's just you look at aviation and you look at infantry from a Marine perspective, aviation, when we started 9-11, is significantly higher in manpower than it was 9-11. Take a look at infantry. Not that infantry's gone down, aviation has come up and other areas of, of you know, warfare, military occupation specialties for the Marine Corps. So we look 10 years out every year. That's what we're trying to get at. And trying to match budget, trying to match people, you know, to make all that work. It's a very, no one else outside of the, this building has to do a complex job like that. So I would say don't compare us with any other Google or anybody out there, because over 2 million in the uniform, over 2 million every day in the uniform. In this building alone, 22 plus thousand, just on the DOD umbrella, attached to the building, whether they're in the building physically or someplace else. Nobody has that complexity to do. And the fact that we're sitting here enjoying freedom, freedom is not free. It's not free. And we fully understand that. So this, this is why we wanted to address you today, to let you know we care more as much as our bosses and anyone about personnel and readiness. Make no mistake about it, the quality of life, that is our, our talk. Okay, we got time for two quick ones. I'll go to you, sir, and Christina will finish off with you. Okay, go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, my question is that uh, U.S. Uh, and India, as far as military to military relations, they have been growing on the last 20 years and now as we enter the new year, where do we uh, go now as far as uh, we had many uh, exercises and also India is now facing terrorism across the nation from Pakistan. Osama bin Laden was found in Pakistan, now still terrorists are still there. So one of our, our Secretary of Defense's lines of effort is to uh, assure our allies and meet our alliance commitments, but also attract new partners. So one of the things we're doing globally is we're going to continue to keep these international engagements so we can continue to partner with people on our shared uh, defense, our shared security, and things like that. So I think you're going to see more and more as we move forward in the future, as we continue to get after building this expeditionary force, you're going to see more and more engagements uh, with other countries out there as we look to attract new partners. And Christina, we'll finish off with you. Great. Thank you so much um, all for doing this. Um, Secretary Mathis often uh, talks about the military as a model for society, and, and so I wanted to ask, um, you know, how do you keep the force strong and united, especially when the country seems so divided right now? So I'll start off, and then Dan, I'll ask you to comment on that next. So um, when you look at, look, look at this table up here. Look at that diversity at this table up here, all right? Um, and you look across our military, um, it is the model of what the United States of America is. And that's where the strength of what we do is built on our diversity, on our ability to learn from each other and to make each other better and to lean on each other uh, in times of uh, distress or in combat or whatever it may be. So, you know, the Secretary talks about this all the time because he wants us to understand that because of who we are, it, it comes with responsibility and we have to show the American people what the United States military represents, and it is the United States of, of America. Hey, let me just say one thing, and then then uh, I'll let you. You know, one a couple of things. One, you know, we're as military members, we're 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 taught from the beginning uh, to be apolitical when it comes to a lot of those issues. Now, that being said, we all have thoughts about various things that happen in this country that happen in our in our uh, communities. But I think what what to answer your question, what keeps us strong is that uh, almost every service member. Uh, <clears throat> has values that we rally around, uh, values that you know we care deeply about, uh, and and those missions and those things that that we do together on a regular basis keep us strong and keep us you know and, and allow us to be able to compartmentalize our political views and thoughts and uh, and and values with the values that we share as service members. Go ahead, for me. Yeah, I would debate the fact that, and I don't believe personally that our country is divided. First of all. I think we're very much united. Um, and uh, 
and our soldiers, uh, how do we keep them united? Um, because they all live under the same cause. Our job is to do one thing, fight and win our nation's wars when asked to do so. And they have to rely on each other every single day. Are there uh, pockets of, of uh, civilian life that could probably uh, learn from that? I agree. Is it divided? By m no means anywhere, I believe, that our nation is divided. But I'm a very positive-based person. Um, and I think that's what um, I agree with uh, my counterpart, is that we have a set of values by which we live under. And uh, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, as long as you meet those standards and want to live by those values, you can be a member of this greatest organization the arm, the, this nation has ever known. Go ahead, Gio. Yeah, I, I, our Navy understands this. We understand our ships. We understand what the word shipmate means. And we understand what means taking care of yourself is all about. Right? And, and there's three major moving parts in all those. Right? You're no good to anybody if you don't take care of yourself. So sailors do that. And once you've taken care of yourself, you're going to take care of others. You always think of your shipmates. You think more of others than you think of yourself in many regard. And at the end of the day, we're all going to deploy together on this thing we call a ship, right? And you can call it an aircraft. You can call it whatever platform you want to call it. We coined it a ship. So you think of ship, shipmate, <coughs> self, centered on the core values of honor, courage, and commitment. That'll keep you focused on everything that matters and keep you united in those efforts. And that's what drives our teams out there. And that's what it's all about. Teams out there doing great things, empowered to be the people that you need us to be out there. Go ahead, Sergeant. You know, I'll say one thing. I, I, you know, I was going to talk about teams, um, and it's, it's, it's great you brought that up. Make no mistake, we, we, we come from, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, Confederate flags, uh, Charlottesville, kneeling down on knees. That's where we go on leave. We recruit from those places. We go back on leaving those places. Don't think for one second we don't recognize what's going on out there. There are some things, and every life matters. Um, the, the amazing thing is, and what he means by the model, is that we come from those same places, yet we set aside all of those differences to go forward and be willing to die for the very people that we love, for the nation, the Constitution, and the flag you know that, that, that we honor. Uh, that's the unique thing. We brought in something called spiritual fitness in the Marine Corps. We were challenged by the civilian, some of them out there about, oh, you're talking about God. Well, if, if you believe in God, yeah, we're talking about that. But we're really talking about the spirit that regardless of where we come from, when the chaplain says, let us pray. I've never been in a formation in 34 years. And even in combat, where a Marine, sailor, anybody under the Eagle Globe and Anchor would say, I'm going to request mass because I don't want to be in that formation. We truly understand that that's an opportunity to dedicate ourselves to the soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman, national guardsman, to our left and to our right, to say, if you're down on the battlefield, I'm coming to get you. I'm willing to put my life on the line like those, like a Cal Carpenter, a Corporal Dunham, a Sergeant Dakota Meyer in the last 16 years, and all the others who've earned the Purple Hearts. You, you know, that's, that's what he means by the model on 9 12. This nation put everything aside, and we were willing to accept risk by putting ourselves forward. How soon we forget. And if we continue to forget, like Pearl Harbor, like 9-11, another day will come when the enemy will make it a home game for us. And on home games, we lose. We want to play all of our games on somebody else's territory. When the enemy brings it to our territory, we lose. We absolutely lose. And as Joan Dumper would say, we get no credit tomorrow for what we've done today. And we don't want to have to lose, you know, to learn, as the commandant says. Those are the things. We've, that's what the model's all about. It wasn't about the spiritual fitness. It wasn't about God. It was a spirit that embodies us to go forward and be willing to die for people like yourselves on a daily basis. That's what, that's what the model is. So if I could close that out. Uh... On the worst day of my military career, on 19 July 2007, when uh, my patrol came under attack and one of my soldiers was killed in action and another was severely wounded in action and we were pinned down under fire and uh, we called for a quick reaction force, I was not worried about what race, what gender, or who the other person was on the other end. I just knew there was an American voice on the other end that said, Sergeant Major, we're coming to get you. And that's the bottom line, and that's why uh, the U.S. Armed Forces is what it is today.
So ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much. I'm sorry, sir, we're out of time. Thank you all so much for allowing us to be here today. We hope this is a start of something that we can do more often because one thing that you're gonna find out of all of us, and I think you heard it today, is we focus on our greatest commodity that we have in the U.S. Armed Forces, and that's the men and women that raise their hand and swear an oath to serve uh, in this country and to defend our homeland and way of life. So God bless you all. Thanks again, and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Just wanted to say.